Hello and welcome to Access Chat. I'm delighted to finally welcome Zara Gemmel from Hex Productions. First met a few years ago um, in May, I believe, because you came to one of our GAD events and uh, we've been talking ever since. Um, but before we tell people what we've been working on together, perhaps you could tell us a bit about yourself and Hex Productions and how you came to be interested in, in accessibility. Oh, well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Um, yeah, coming across Neil on many occasions lately, so that's really good fun. Um, Hex, um, I'll give you a bit of background about Hex and where we started. So I joined Hex when it became a limited company in 2015. Um, that's when uh, we, sorry, I'm rubbish. That's when we um, founded uh, a new business model, basically. Um, we tested one of our local authority websites and it was before the public sector legislation um, so we used disabled user testers on one of the websites it's something that has been done at this particular local authority before um, I'd not seen it before so going to see a, a user testing team um, down in Neath was a whole new experience for me um, we came back from that after witnessing Alan Sleet who's a disabled user tester um, he's blind and it just absolutely gobsmacked me watching somebody trying to navigate something that isn't accessible. Um, it really hit my heart and I couldn't come away and do nothing. So uh, we went back to Hex. We changed our entire business model. We looked at all of the websites that we host and maintain and we changed everything. We changed all of the code. Uh, to bring it up to accessibility standards and we did that for free for all of our clients. Uh, it was important to us because I couldn't, I couldn't not come away from that without having changed something. So from then on it was kind of the, the way forward. Uh, we looked at um, organisations that were doing it, we looked to get involved where we could and that's where we sprung upon uh, Accessibility London. So we started Going down to Accessibility London, I uh, met Alistair Duggan from the Government Digital Services. Uh, he invited us along to the Home Office roundtable events that were uh, responsible for turning the EU law into the UK law for the public sector legislation. Um, and that just spurred us on even more, you know, being involved with something from the beginning was really quite um, amazing. Uh, we continued with the uh, Accessibility London events. We uh, went to the Global Accessibility Awareness Day, ATOS, and also the Barclays Tech Show Pro that year, uh, just to be in the environment of people that care, know, and want to do something about it was really quite amazing. Sadly, coming back into the industry after visiting these massive events was a bit of a, a shocker because it just opened my eyes to how many people weren't doing anything. You know, there was no awareness people didn't understand what accessibility was, let alone how to implement it. So it really dawned on me the amount of effort it was gonna to take to raise the awareness of what accessibility means. Well, so I, so I didn't realize you'd actually gone back and retrofitted everything for free, which is fantastic. I think that's, that's absolutely great. Um, and yes, it, you know, I, I share your pain in terms of understanding yeah we're we're out there we're trying to boil the ocean with all of this stuff because there's an awful lot of inaccessible stuff out there there's an awful lot of people that don't even know to care because actually i think like you you didn't know previously it wasn't that you didn't care you didn't know um i think there's a lot of the people just don't know we don't teach it uh it's not part of the, the education uh, and, and that's been one of my real passions, driving passions for myself and for Deborah and for Antonio has been to get that message out there so that people understand the need uh, and then find ways to actually start teaching people about it and um, spread the skills as well. So I know that you're, um, you know, you went to the meetups, but you now run one as well. So you run Accessibility Nottingham. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So on the back of uh, Global Accessibility Awareness Day and coming down to ATOS and, and realising that there's only one meetup in the entire UK, which is in London, um, it was nonsensical really to not try and reproduce that in the Midlands. 
Um, there has since been a few more pop up, which is really, really good to see, but uh, we piloted Accessibility Nottingham in 2018. Uh, we did three events before Christmas to see how we could attract the audience and see if we could get sponsorship, etc. Um, sadly, sponsorship seems to be a very hard thing to get hold of, uh, especially on a subject that isn't really uh, recognised or wasn't at the time. You know, it's come a long way in a year. Um, so we, uh, for the next year, we set it up again. We did a bit more research this time. Um, we took on a couple of University of Nottingham interns for the summer. Uh, one was a philosophy student who had an interest in digital marketing and the other one was a computer science um, student and they both absolutely blew me away. They, they came on board, they did exactly what I needed, they went above and beyond, they learnt more than I imagined they'd be able to learn in such a small space of time. They produced a website for Accessibility Nottingham for me uh, with a bit of guidance on branding and that kind of thing. They um, marketed the whole event, so they, they put a whole Twitter campaign together. They put up all the, uh, the assets for, for social media and they absolutely blew it out of the park. And the interest that we got from the first meetup compared to the interest we did, that we got the previous year was just phenomenal. I mean, we're not pulling hundreds of people, but it was just so nice to be able to have an impact in a, in a small area, a small space of time. Um, we want it to be a, we don't want it to be a tech event, we wanted it to be a community event, so the whole point was to mix and mingle disabled people because I think there's a real sense of not knowing what to do with a disabled person, no matter what their disability, it's the kind of, well I can't go and talk to that person, well why, why not, it's a human being, just interact, talk, um, and towards the end, before the whole lockdown situation, we we were having a nice little mix of people and, and it was opening opening people's eyes and breaking down barriers and that's all we want to do really. It's, it's not really about, it, it's about digital inclusion but it's also about creating a community. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, sorry, <clears throat> um, I, I love the point that you made, a couple of points that I want to talk about a couple of points you made. So one of the points I love is that how this experience with another human being just touched you to your core and it changed your life, it changed your purpose. Um, or maybe you found your purpose. I, I think that's one thing that a lot of us share in the accessibility and the inclusion industry. It's like, we're just so passionate about it for so many different reasons. And it's, it's lovely as it continues to be bigger and bigger and bigger reasons. Some of us joined it because they were a parent of a child with a disability. Some of us joined it because we had disabilities ourselves, so we were touched by it. But more and more we see people joining because they, they look at it and they're like, well, oh, well, why would I not want to design things that included everyone? It, it just makes so much sense. So I love that part of your story. I also thought it was interesting and I applaud you for doing, making all those changes for free. I applaud that, but at the same time, I hate that you have to do it for free like that. I, I have spent a lot of time, and we have on Access Chat, talking about how we're going to have to do a better job, certainly in the, from now on, um, appreciating the work that people are doing for social good, things that really impact us in positive ways. And what we're learning through this COVID-19 virus is that people that maybe we didn't realize added as much value to society are on our front lines, adding the most value to society and actually in some cases giving up their lives. So I'm hoping that humanity will not forget the lessons we're gonna learn during these times, but it just feels like your story is so relevant to what we're walking right now in the world. So I have to, I knew I loved you the second that you joined with that beautiful hair, but I just really, really applaud, you know, all the work you are doing because this is how you change the world. This is how you do it. So yeah, and, and y'all been, yeah. Well, and y'all been doing these meetups in person and virtually, is that right? Uh, it's just been person at the moment. Okay. Obviously we're gonna have to switch to a virtual environment at the moment, but um, right. we're also taking away from the fact that I was speaking to you uh, Martin Sibley the other day, um, he's just launched Purple Goat Agency um, and he said well you really should do it online as well as on on a physical standpoint if you can in the future and I, it's not really something that I consider doing. We have been videoing the meetups but I'd not really thought about casting them 
Um, and I think he said, you're going to reach a wider audience that way. And it just makes sense, doesn't it really? But the whole point was to try and to make a community out of it as well. But the, the both will come hand in hand, I'm sure. Yeah, Martin was on um, the program a few weeks ago and we adore Martin. We just think his, his work is just amazing. And, and it just shows once again, we're all so much stronger together doing this work. So it's, um, and I think he makes such a good point because sometimes, you know, I don't know, uh, all three of us, uh, Antonio, Neil and I were, we were all over the world. We were like, we could never tell where Antonio, where's Antonio this week, <laughs> you know, before the COVID-19 virus, it's like, you know, Neil's off you know, showing us his vacation photo. It, it was just very interesting. We were all, all over the place. But is that really what we're going to do with our society? Certainly, we're not going to do it anytime soon. And so I think, you know, Martin brings up a really good point. Not only, even when we get back to whatever we do in person, uh, there's always people that, for whatever reason, can't join maybe because disabilities or, you know, cost or they're too, too busy doing other things, but they still want to be engaged and get the data. I, I think that more and more we need to do this. And that, of course, all of those efforts continue to drive accessibility, inclusive design, because you don't want to do something that's not accessible to everybody. So applause for that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, the the whole story as well for me started when I was young. I I was introduced to a deaf mute man um, from my grandma, and we used to go bicycling together. Um, and he he communicated in his own way, and you learnt his patterns, and it it, it worked. Um, and I think people, if people just make a little bit more of an effort, then we can go a long way. You know, there's it's frightening. Yeah, I I agree, and the world's frightening. But if you don't try, you know, it's this brings me onto the BSL issue, you know, try, try, you can pick up a few little signs that are going to help you just at least look like you care, <laughs> you know, just try a little bit harder. Oh, uh, you were mentioning that you, you decided to um, go back to what you have built to your customers and making it accessible. Uh, can you tell us about uh, how you're able to to bring that knowledge up of your team in terms of accessibility? What have you done to make sure that you're able to achieve your goal and making your customer sites uh, accessible? Okay, so we we've worked a lot on our internal processes to start with, um, but then obviously the user is the most important person. So I was looking out for partnerships and see where we could influence or be influenced by someone that was already doing a grand job of user research. Um, we have found a user testing team um, that we have now partnered with and it means that we can now provide an end-to-end -end process. So we can do design and wireframe reviews with real users. We can do development um, reviews either internally or externally um, and we can also offer an accreditation of a website. Uh, so the way we upskilled the team was just to bring them on the journey with us. And we try and do the same with any of our clients. You know, we, we influ influence them from the beginning and try and get them on the, on board with the process instead of retrofitting everything and, and then coming with a, uh, an end product that then needs to be made accessible. Well, no, flip it around. Let's start from the beginning. Let's start with an accessible model. Let's look at your designs. Can the you know the wireframe be navigated correctly in the first place before you even layer it up with anything colourful and pretty? Um, so we we try and incorporate the whole process, and having the user testing team is just an an amazing amazing partnership. Um, so the end process is when we've fixed all of the issues either with a, a website that needed some attention or we've built it from scratch. We then go and user test it, and they get accredited and. Uh, there's then a subscription model that can follow so that we can keep up to date. Um, it's something that we're doing with a lot of our local authority clients. So then we can just provide a monthly report, have a quick scan, quick technical review, quick manual review, and they can maintain their accessibility status at the end of the year with provide another accreditation. And it's just a nice little model. It keeps everything tight and maintained, I suppose. Is there anything that you can share with us in, in relation to uh, those customers you know, before and after uh, you've made your, their site accessible? 
um, from a client perspective or the, the end user perspective? No, for, from both. Okay, so it's hard to get companies on board initially. You know, it normally takes one person. Um, a lot of the time, like Deborah touched upon earlier, it's, it's usually someone that's either experienced a disability firsthand or has a family member that has. Um, and I suppose that's a good place to start, but it's also, you know, the awareness raising piece around accessibility in Otting. I mean, bringing more than just disabled and relatives of disabled people together so that they can share their stories and it does get a wider coverage. Um, so the buy-in from people initially usually starts with one individual. Um, and it's not usually at, at higher levels either, sadly. Um, the clients then, once we once we demonstrate we we demonstrate using assistive technology so if someone approaches us and said well we need to make this accessible how do we go about it we try and reel them back a bit and try and explain why they're doing it first so not just tick box this is done you know off you go it's the whole education process of well do you know what it needs to function to be accessible do you know how your navigation is going to work with a screen reader do you know that big scrolling banner at the top is just absolutely distracting people from your actual content. So we try and educate them on the fact that, you know, users can't use your site. You are excluding people from being able to use your services, being able to pay for things online. And then we try and demonstrate that with assistive technology as well, so that they get the, the first hand experience. And that usually wins them over, you know, it usually makes them reconsider what they're doing and how they're promoting information. Um, and hopefully at the end of that, you know, the customer comes out with a, a better um, outcome. When we speak to Alan, his, his, um, what's the word? his example of a, a poor customer service or customer journey is the fact that if he wants to go and buy a pair of trousers online, if a product isn't described in the description very well, or you can't see it, because obviously he's blind, if he can't see the fabric, he doesn't know how it's going to feel, if he can't see um, the price, sometimes if it's not labelled correctly, you can't even see the price. And then there's the whole issue around the um, checkout system. So a lot of uh, companies will show a little basket with how many items you've got in the basket. But if that's not read out to a screen reader, he doesn't know if it's added to the basket or not. Um, he doesn't know what the values of in the basket. He can't, until he somehow, sometimes you can't even get to the checkout. But if you do get to the checkout, then you don't really know what you've purchased either. So he just wants to be able to get, buy a pair of trousers, get the best value, which also he won't be able to do unless everyone is allowing him to look at their website. So he's restricted with, with the, the products that he can buy just because the website isn't accessible. Uh, and and you know we all we all need trousers. As, we all need trousers. As, as been discussed already on this call, um, <laughs> but uh, it's it's a it's a very valid point, and and I think that it's not just about you know the equity and the access. If you were to go into a physical store and an assistant said, "Oh well, I can't show you the trousers." I'm not going to tell you how much it's going to cost. And, you know, maybe you'll get some, maybe you won't. That's rude. That's really bad customer service. And, you know, what, what company really wants to be rude to their customers? What, you know, well, I mean, there's a few I've been in that actually make a business model of it, but, um, <laughs> but they're few and far between. And, 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 it's, and essentially, yeah, being inaccessible, uh, whether that be technically inaccessible because you don't work with assistive tech or, you know, cognitively inaccessible because you've designed stuff with dark patterns or you are hiding things and making it really difficult for people is equally rude. It's also, you know, it's, it's, it's damaging to their own business because a business where, where you know, your, your front of house are rude to your customers isn't likely to be a business that's going to stick around for a long time. So, so I think that, that you know, 
people need to to grasp that idea and, and maybe you know we we as a business uh, or sorry as an industry need to do better at you know drawing those metaphors out um rather than it being seen as oh yeah well that's just a nice to have kind of thing so um maybe we can do better on that i know deborah's got a comment deborah you know, I yeah. Looking for looking for, I always am trying to look from the lens of a global lens, and then of course, um, at my beautiful little country here, <laughs> United States. But I, um, <clears throat> I'm worried. I'm worried that during all these crises, that um, we'll actually go backwards. And I know that there's a lot of confidence in the accessibility field here in the United States that um, everybody gets it now, and if you don't do it, we're going to keep suing you and all that. But it just feels like that isn't really the right way to keep moving this forward. And, you know, certainly from the states and from others. And I am curious, you know, really from all of you, you know, how do we really move forward? How, because I remember during the financial crisis of 08 and 09, I went and I did a presentation for a government official in one of our states and the the and i won't say which one or who the leader was but at one point the leader said boy you must have a really um this must be a real uphill battle for you and i said what do you mean and he said well you know the normal people have been laid off deborah so and you're in here asking about people with disabilities and i didn't reach across the table and slap the hell <clears throat> the heck out of him but i wanted to but what i did do instead yeah was remind him that many people with disabilities were for him and in his state and in his communities. And um, just because you didn't see them and just because they weren't telling you they needed accommodations to be more productive, didn't mean that they weren't already in the workforce. So I reminded him this was not just about people entering the workforce, this is about us staying in the workforce, staying part of society. So I, um, I think it's gonna take innovation and I think it's really gonna take, you know, we've gotta look at what each other are doing and help, but. I mean, what are what are y'all seeing? What do you what would you recommend to the accessibility industry that watches us, that watches these shows? You know how, you know. I think some of the stuff you're already doing definitely helps, but I'm also curious, Antonio and Neil, what your comments are. But let me give it to our gorgeous guests first. So, bless you, <laughs> Neil and Antonio. That's not you. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. Sorry, I'm kidding. I only I only came in on the guest part, so <laughs> I'll still hand over. Um, a similar story, really. We um, we were working with a or hoping to work with. It didn't come about, but um, a cinema theatre um, production stroke organisation, um, and we were talking about. Uh, making their website accessible first of all, uh, the ticketing system, their booking system, that kind of thing. Um, and then we moved on because they also have an education angle to their establishment. Um, and we were talking about videos and um, obviously captioning is a challenge to some but also an easy option to others. And then I was talking about all oh, about British Sign Language and he was like, yeah, but it's really expensive to uh, procure interpretation for for all of the stuff that we produce he said it'd be really handy though and it'd be really nice to be able to offer that and i said have you ever actually considered employing a deaf person to do that with you and the look of sheer elation on his face was i'd never even thought of that and it was it, i've absolutely gobsmacked that he thought he'd just have to buy in that service, not thought about investing in a person to bring into the organization. And it absolutely gobsmacked me. So I think in answer to that question is to, to employ a wider range of, of people, have the, the skills within the organization instead of thinking, well, we'll go out to a user group and they'll tell us what we need to know and we'll do some disability research and just hire people, hire a, a range of abilities and you'll have everything that you need in-house you won't have to pay out for extra resources to do extra research on users mm. wow excellent okay. points Neil? Uh, it's, 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 it's a really good point um i do think that a lot of businesses are just 
in the mindset that you procure services um and that um that that's that's the way they go so it's it's not even an ableist mindset it's not even an, an unconscious bias necessarily it's that they've, they've stopped thinking about hiring people a lot of the time for for certain things even though you know having a, an employee might be cheaper um, because we've we've structured our economies here in 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 the west and particularly in the uh, sort of anglophone west um by outsourcing everything um and and i think that one of the big disruptions we're going to see uh, and are seeing right now with covid 19 is the fact that actually that's not been great for our supply chains or our resilience or our ability to cope with anything um because just in time doesn't work when the world is shut down and that your supply is uh, half a world away in a country you're busy insulting uh, or, or or closer in the case of the uk because we like to insult our close neighbors yeah. um so getting a little political here but essentially i think that that we will have to look at new models we will have to look at more community driven uh, models um goodness knows what this you know massively deep recession that we're heading into will 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 do to our economies what it can't be is that it just goes to the rent take all of the money goes to the rent taking class we can't go back to what was considered normal before because um we have an opportunity as a, as a society to actually be more inclusive to build back better to do all of the things where actually you stimulate the economy by doing good stuff rather than putting um putting all of the the capital back into into the the hands of a, a, a very few so so i do think that we we have an opportunity but i i also think that it is only an opportunity it's not a dead cert there is a real risk the 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 stimulus packages are all going to flow directly to share buybacks and to you know equity funds and not you know flow down to the small businesses and the the little companies that are doing great stuff that or or looking at ways of supporting individuals through uh you know uh universal basic income which again i actually now think is perfectly viable mm -hmm. because if we can spend billions and billions and billions on supporting everybody's wages through furlough schemes we could equally afford to do this in the longer term and create a much more flexible and creative economy that can cope with all of the other stuff that's going to come not just the diseases not just the age related disabilities not just the fact that we're all going to have to care for those people because it's not just about you know accessibility but we've got this inverted pyramid right now so we're going to have lots and lots of older people uh we're not set up to care for them as a state so it's going to be down to individuals if the individuals can't do that because they've got to work all of the time then we're going to be overburdening the state again so we have to think about these things at a at a strategic level at a sort of macroeconomic level so i think there's there's a lot that could be really really positive but it's on us to hold the people to account and 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 what happens over the next few months is going to be really interesting i i've seen lots of people go yeah look look we've shown that we can you know work from home now and yes we 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 disabled people amongst whom i count myself um you know can remote work and you you know we've shown you that this stuff works and we can do it and everything else we need to be there and in that conversation and shaping those things um over the next few months and years to come and i think that's one of the reasons why i'm interested in the whole education process and i know you are too so maybe that's the last topic we'll cover today because i know i've rambled um uh, it was brilliant i think <laughs> <laughs> but i do I really but i do think that, that i'm going to vote for you 
Can no, you run, I'm not please? standing for anything. Um, but, um, <laughs> but but the other, the last thing, that, and, and the reason that Zara and I have been working together quite a lot is on apprenticeships. So young people building inclusive stuff. So, um, so Zara, do you want to say a little bit about why you got involved in, in the apprenticeships? Yeah, sure. Again, it's, it's taking it back to basics. Put it into the education system. Make it an inclusive, accessible education system. Not only for the people that need it physically and mentally, but to educate the ones that need the awareness. You know, and the whole... That, that's kind of my next focus in life is to to make universities and colleges think about not only the the students that they're taking but also the people that they can educate and influence you know and I think sadly I think the world doesn't operate in a top-down approach or a lot of organizations don't anyway you know the leadership should be coming from the top um, but I think your student population is is really where it's going to start to hit. And if we can influence them at, at a young age and show what can be possible in the world, then we've got a better chance of, of making this happen. Um, virtual learning environments, you know, they're not accessible. We've been working with a, a couple of universities on them and it's just shocking that, that people can't even access information in the first place, let alone learn how to get along in the world and, and make it a better place. So um, after all this time, it is shocking. It's I, shocking. I, I, I was actually Aren't I, you an educator. I was, I, I was, uh, I'm in a series of groups that are supposed to support teachers in, in online. The people just decided to start using online solutions to support their, uh, their students and without any support from schools or education system. And I, I started to look at the communication for some of the vendors. And, and sometimes I, I was coming across this. Reach out your, uh, your IT person. Reach out your, well, a school doesn't have an IT person. Uh, reach out an administrator. The school doesn't have an IT administrator. So okay. some of the vendors, they're still you know, thinking in kind of a, they're modern tools, but they think in old IT. Okay? They're still there. They don't realize that they need to develop a solution in a way that the teacher can go set up something in a, in a couple of minutes and is running, ready to go. And then they don't have to go back to that again because they have kids to take care and they have, they have personal lives. So I still see, especially in education that we're talking about, this mentality from vendors that is, is actually not matching the need uh, that the... And it's, it could be... An, uh, something that they could take advantage because teachers they really want to use the tools but i think they are still over complicating yeah and a lot of establishments are still like you say they're quite old-fashioned i mean a lot of public sector um that we we've come across you know they've still got internal servers and um we've had a whole issue with a an inquiry recently where nobody can work from home accurately and correctly because the server is in a building and nobody can get correct access to it. It's like, come on, are we, are we really still that far behind? So let alone the infrastructure, you know, that, that blows my brains out, but the, the education system is definitely also lagging behind. Um, I've spent some time with, again, in a, a virtual learning environment, we were interviewing some faculty, um, and we were telling them, uh, it was basically awareness raising piece around what accessibility means and how it should be implemented within the, a university environment. And a lot of the, uh, the faculty were saying, well, why isn't this in our uh, you know, HR plan? And why isn't this um, a learning plan that we should all be doing within our, you know, your equalities and diversity and your um, health and safety and all that kind of thing? Why isn't that a standard document within their monthly or quarterly learning plan? if it starts there, then you've got half a chance of putting it into the education itself, but it's not even there. So yeah, to build, to build my, my probably, probably my dream would be to build firstly a, a, a VLE that is accessible and then the services and the, the actual training resources within them to also be accessible because again, a lot of them don't even know how to produce accessible documents. 
So a Word document to be accessible, please just everyone can please everyone just learn how to make a Microsoft Word document accessible. It's not it'll hard. So much. It will change so much. It's not hard. <laughs> it's not hard. No. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the, the accessibility, the apprenticeship was just like, wow, I need to get involved. I need to be there. I need to be on the top of this. I need to be underneath it. I need to be in the middle of it. I need to be part of what's going to be the future in, in my eyes. You know, I think we're, we're doing an amazing thing. And I think it's, it's quite funny because even, you know, the, the Institute has struggled with the concept and that also makes me laugh. Um, to deliver something is also challenging them to have to think about how they deliver um, the systems and the processes that that we're working with currently and I think that's also quite amusing. It's it's amusing but it's also quite I suppose gratifying that we're pushing through through the fact that we're uh, creating this standard with them they're having to change their practices um, and it's it's flowing through into the other apprenticeships. Um, I know we need to close, and I need to thank our our sponsors, Barclays Access, Microlink, and MyClearText for you know keeping the show on the road, keeping the lights on, keeping us captioned and accessible. So, um, but I I did want to say thank you for all of your contributions, and, and give a shout out also for the Institute of Coding, which is a consortium of universities, because there's a whole bunch of free courses available um, as a result. The government is encouraging um, lots of um, free courses at the moment because people are at home. And um, the latest one is actually create accessible interfaces. So big woot woot because uh, we're actually getting some traction. So uh, I, I think this is great. So thank you very much, Zara. It's been a pleasure as always. Thank you very much, Neil. Thanks, Deborah. You were wonderful. Wonderful, Zara. <laughs> Hope to see you soon.